Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comps, and welcome to Survival Radio 2. How far will this radio talk? Those of us who work in the communications discipline are quite used to handing a radio to an individual user, and their first question being, well, how far will this radio talk? And any communications professional worth their salt is going to be hesitant to answer that question for the simple reason that there are so many variables involved, it's hard to give that simple question a definitive answer. The reality is, is that the answer you give that individual could be seen as very underwhelming because there's so many different things involved. I mean, all of us have biases. We're all used to having a cellular telephone that's connected just about everywhere. In a disaster area, you bring in a group of people who are used to operating on a radio system that provides jurisdiction-wide coverage you know, with 90% in-building portable radio coverage, and then you're basically operating off of one repeater. And that's something to understand, that if you are looking at radio performance from the standpoint of having repeaters or a DMR network or something like that, when you're just talking radio to radio, you're gonna be underwhelmed. However, if you've got no internet, You've got no DMR network, you've got no Fusion, you've got no D-Star. So if you look at your expectations of performance through that eyepiece of uh, infrastructure supported network, you're going to be extremely disappointed when you do have to talk radio to radio because all of these radios on this table right here use line of sight. That's it. If you are within visual range of that other receiving station, you're good to go. If not, there's a lot of other variables that are involved. The exception to that is the HF radio. However, there's no magic in HF radio. It's the magic is in the ionosphere. It's not in the radio. Another expectation of performance that's fraught with peril is past practice or what you've experienced before in the past. There are certain times that the chicken bones of radio voodoo all come together and extraordinary things happen but you do not base your performance expectations upon the extraordinary you base your performance expectations upon what works 24 7 365 for example i was on a backpacking trip one time i was on on top of jane bald in north carolina and the radio i have is a little tiny icom icq 7a it's a little uh, uh vhf uhf um transceiver that used two AA batteries. And I carried on a QSO with a guy that was flying an airplane, a small private plane, over uh, Central Ohio. And it was it was great. I mean, we had great signal strength, and we weren't on a repeater. We were on uh, 146.52 megahertz, and it was awesome. But I don't base my performance expectations of my VHF radio on that particular experience because that was an aircraft that was at a much higher altitude and i was at a high altitude in the mountain and things just worked out well and this is what we have to understand another thing to consider is is your performance in at your hunting camp for example and then you come back to your house and you expect that same kind of performance in the swamp it's going to be different it's going to be different in a suburb it's going to be different in a large city there's all these different variables you have to take into account the more work you put into your communications plan and understanding the limitations of your equipment and how it performs in different environments the better off you're going to be and one thing to be aware of is the internet expert Bad advice is like herpes, man. It's everywhere. You can see it proliferate through videos and comments. All of these radios and devices you see in front of you are governed by the laws of physics. And there's no pseudoscience that's going to come out on Amazon that's going to take this radio and change its performance characteristics beyond the levels of reasonability. Well, let's start looking at some computer models here. And we'll start out with a professionally engineered system to see just what kind of performance characteristics we can expect from a VHF marine radio. To illustrate what we're talking about, we're just on the U.S. Coast Guard website and Rescue 21 Sector Jacksonville. And this shows our contour, coverage contours, or received contours for the VHF stations. And it tells you right at the bottom, the system requirement is 20 miles offshore for a 1 watt VHF FM channel 16 signal transmitted from 2 meters above the water surface. Well, now that we know the intended performance parameters of the system and what it's intended to be engineered for, 
we can start to ask ourselves some questions like, well, what happens if you are a little bit more than 20 miles out and all you have is a handheld VHF radio and, you know, you're not going to be six foot above the water if you're in your life preserver in a small life raft. You know, what options do we have available to us? So in our scenario, it's physically impossible for us to elevate our transmitter any more than where we're at currently. Uh, an option we could utilize is, is having something like this, which is an inflatable antenna. This is a 3 dB antenna, a 5 8 wave, which is ground independent, of course, and when you get it, it's in this little bag right here. So this is the antenna itself inflated, and it uses a CO2 cylinder has 20 foot of RG174 coax and a couple of other little options for it. So this is a very sensible thing to have along with your portable VHF radio in your overboard bag. So here's the program we're going to use. This is Cloud RF. I like the program myself. It uses an OSM um, model for mapping and we've placed ourselves in pretty much the center of the state we're in Polk County at that point right there. Our terrain where we're at is open terrain. You can see it's Old Grove. And this will give you some best case scenario kind of coverage you can anticipate. The model we're using is the Longley Rice model, which is a, a pretty common model. And what's going to be important to us over here is these three colors, the, the green, blue, and red. Uh, green is excellent, blue is usable, and red is going to be marginal, if not totally unusable. To put this into context, a FM broadcast station that you're receiving a good signal on in your vehicle driving around town is typically a received signal strength of minus 60 decibel milliwatts. And at the opposite end, a signal of minus 119 decibel milliwatts is going to be a signal that's almost indecipherable above the noise and distortion in the radio receiver itself. All right, this is the scale we're going to leave the map at, and we can see here the city of Lake Wales again is five miles away. We have State Road 20 or Highway 27 and State Road 60, and these will give us some points of reference. The uh, models we're going to run right now are going to be a five kilometer radius. This is our first model. This is a VHF portable radio talking to another VHF portable radio at five watts. And this radius is five kilometers. So 3.1 miles from here to from the center of radiation to the outside of the model. And you can see the red is unusable. This model represents what happens when you take your portable radio and you put up a roll-up J-pole or a My Survival Comms ground plane kit and hang it from a tree at 18 feet of how it affects your coverage. This is, again, this is a 5-kilometer model here, but you can see that we've cleaned out all of our red that we had in here before, and this must be a high spot right here. Now we've taken our 5-watt VHF portables and place them in the Oki Finoki and you can see this right here is five kilometers from here to the outside of the circle and you can see how much smaller our coverage contour is with the red much more prevalent in there due to all the foliage. Now you can see why 800 megahertz is no bueno in heavily forested areas. Right here is our same same thing as the VHF, two portable radios trying to talk to each other but this is five kilometers here and look how much smaller our coverage area is. And this is at UHF and you can see our coverage area has gotten small, smaller than the VHF but larger than the 800 across here. Now we've taken our 5 watt portables for a trip to the mountains and this is our transmitter 5 watt portable radio on top of Klingman's Dome and this is 20 kilometers across here so you can see the interesting kind of coverage that we get and just how there's a complete lack of coverage interspersed with great coverage and with moderate coverage. It's easy to see in mountainous terrain just how difficult it is to provide consistent coverage for all stations. Here's our suburban model. Our coverage is five kilometers from the center radiation to the outside of our model. 
and based upon my personal experience in this particular area right here that this model is entirely too generous that your current coverage is just outside the green for portable radio to portable radio and we've taken our two 5 watt portable radios to Atlanta and we're currently outside of the Peachtree Plaza and five kilometers again and we can see how all the structure kind of skews our radiation pattern in this model. This model is two mobile radios. These are uh, just 20 watt output mobile radios running quarter wave antennas and you can see just how much larger our coverage has become. This right here is a 10 kilometer. If I go back to the scale we were on before, whoops, that's where we were at before and you can just see how much larger our green is and how much our coverage has increased. This model is two VHF stations using 20 watts of power. Antennas are mounted at 60 feet of height, talking from one station to the other. And this is the kind of coverage we can anticipate from something like that according to the model. Here's our center of radiation. This is our edge of the model. And the edge of the model here in this example is 60 kilometers. So. Not quite into I-4, um, uh, certainly not into Disney World yet or anything like that, but this shows you how much larger that coverage area becomes just by elevating antenna. This model represents field deployable infrastructure. Let's say that you brought in a VHF repeater and put, have it on a Luma Tower or a Pepro trailer and you set it up for 100 feet is what this model is. The model itself, this is 30 kilometers from center radiation to the outside of the model. Theoretically, anything within blue should be able to talk to one another since that center of radiation is a repeater. Now keep in mind, this is a very generous model. Uh, this doesn't take into account in-building coverage. And my experience has been from the center of radiation to the outside is five miles so you end up with like a 10 mile footprint with portable radios with a, a setup such as this so we're getting a little more range out of that in the model but it does it gives you some good food for thought this model here is an individual with a two watt aviation band portable radio the station he is trying to talk to is at 500 feet of altitude this right here from, from the center of radiation to the outside of our model is 30 kilometers and this gives you an idea of the kind of coverage you have taking advantage of elevation. Now we've bumped our search aircraft up to a thousand feet and you can see just how much larger the area covered is. Now you may ask yourself well, why didn't you cover HF radio in this video? The reason why is is because I'm putting HF radio in an entirely separate video because there's so many other variables that are in place. HF radio, from my observations in the YouTube and preparedness community, uh, outside of the people that are experienced in its use, is kind of a misunderstood concept in my opinion. It's something that, it's an extremely valuable tool, but an HF radio to properly use it isn't something you can hand to an, a user and give them a five minute class on and they're going to use it effectively. That being the case, I don't feel like adding HF radio to this video would do it justice. I will tell you that the performance of HF radio and line of sight performance is very similar to what you're seeing with the radio system shown in this particular video here. And keep an eye out for that on Survival Radio 3. Let's say that our system fails to meet our expectations and we're in the middle of a situation and we have to take some kind of corrective action. This is our toolbox right here. The first and most important one is, is if possible, to increase your elevation or change your position. At fringe coverage, just slight changes to the left or the right of a, a tree or a man-made object can make tremendous differences in your radio coverage. Elevating your position, bringing your antenna up, makes a huge difference in radio coverage as well. Our second tool, considering carrying a more efficient antenna system in your survival radio kit or your radio kit in general, and having 
that resource available to you. Although it may take a little more time to set that device up, it's going to provide you with a more reliable talk path and it's going to allow you to reduce your power output to preserve your battery life. Number four is to reduce system losses. This is something that's more of a planning consideration than an operational consideration because you probably don't have the equipment on hand to actually make this happen. But when you're planning your more efficient antenna system that takes advantage of elevation, perhaps use the best feed line or the best quality feed line you can afford to carry weight-wise and keep those links at a minimum. It also minimizes the use of adapters. You're trying to streamline your system so you have the minimum amount of loss in your system that's practical for your application. Number five is increasing RF power. Uh, increasing RF power is not going to do any good if you're barely making the signal of whatever station you're trying to contact or whatever piece of infrastructure you're trying to contact. If you can barely hear it by taking your survival radio and increasing the power output it's not going to assist you now if the other station can barely hear you but yet you hear them well then increasing your power output makes sense and you should always try to use the minimum power necessary to maintain communication battery is a finite resource and there may be situations to where you don't want your transmissions being intercepted by someone and in that case, minimizing your power output and your RF signature in general is advisable. In conclusion, this is my rough rule. My rough rule is indiscriminate of equipment manufacturer. It's indiscriminate of modulation type. doesn't matter whether you're running analog or digital. These rules still apply. This rough rule is based upon flat terrain, the use of less than 3 dB omni antennas, an RF power of 5 watts for a portable radio and an RF power output of 25 watts for a mobile radio. This rule is based upon the presumption that your equipment is properly fielded, properly operating, and properly operated. Portable radio to portable radio is one mile. A mobile radio to mobile radio is three miles. We talk about that, we're talking about either a mobile or portable from position one to position two. A properly operating and properly operated field deployable repeater with 15 watts of power output at 50 foot of elevation will provide three miles of portable radio coverage and six miles of mobile radio coverage. It's important to remember that when you're using a repeater that if you were talking a portable radio to portable radio through the benefit of the repeater you'd be essentially running a six mile talk path whereas if you were running a mobile radio to a mobile radio it would be a 12 mile talk path or if you're talking from a mobile radio through the repeater to a portable user it would be nine miles and so on and so forth. Necessary to increase your system performance remember your toolbox increase elevation, change position, use a more efficient antenna, minimize loss in your system, or increase RF power. I hope this helps. This is Brett from Survival Comms. Till next time.